Hi, Dan. Hello, Bob. How you doing? Good. Good to see you again. Same here. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show. You are Dan Coffin. You have your own show. It's called Sophia, uh, which is an allusion to wisdom, which in turn is an allusion to philosophy, which is what your podcast is about. People should subscribe to your podcast if they haven't already. Like this one, it's available on meaningoflife.tv. Um, and this is the second in a series, I guess, of self-indulgent podcasts I'm doing. Self-indulgent in the sense that we are hashing out, or at least over, uh, depending on whether we reach any kind of agreement, I guess, uh, some uh, issues raised by several lectures, a series of five lectures I delivered at Union Theological Seminary, and which got a certain amount of uh, critical feedback in the comments section, some of which came from you, which is how uh, I, I decided it might be interesting to talk to you. And um, so here we are. <clears throat> we, we, had, we did one of these already, and that's up on the site. Um, and this one is devoted to what I call moral imagination, which involves putting yourself in the shoes of other people. Uh, I think after this, in what will probably be a separate show, a separate podcast, we're going to talk about issues involving cosmic purpose or the lack thereof and so on. And you know, one thing, Dan, that I've concluded these two subjects have in common, moral imagination and cosmic purpose, is you bring them up, they drive people crazy. <laughs> and I would argue that they, they lead people to uh, be so reflexively dismissive that they don't always devote a whole lot of time to seeing what you're saying in the first place. But well, maybe that's my, maybe it's my fault that I'm not communicating clearly enough. I'm definitely trying to cover a lot of ground and some subtle stuff, but, but like many people, I, I, I fear I've been misunderstood. Well, you, you know, this is one of these things where wherever you're hitting something where people have very strongly had prior commitments, there's a risk of this. Um, I will say, however, that I think maybe more than most, most typically is the case, there's been a lot of a lot of the criticism has been substantive and not just abuse. Well, yeah, but since uh, you're uh, since you're one of the people that I'm going to accuse of misunderstanding me, who are you to judge whether they've been misunderstanding me? You know, <laughs> from where I sit, you are all equally deluded, Dan, and I alone am fit to judge. Oh God! <laughs> but we, but this is exactly what we'll talk about, and maybe as is so characteristic of me, I will graciously admit that I was wrong at the end. Have you ever done that? No. <laughs> not even without the graciousness part so far as I know. um so uh okay so let's so so let's this moral imagination thing and you know i i have i am i was perhaps guilty of defining moral imagination trying to define it too broadly but the part of it that i want to focus on and that i definitely put the most emphasis on is what is sometimes called cognitive empathy. In other words, it's not putting yourself in people's shoes in the sense of feeling their pain, but just in the sense of perspective taking and understanding how things look to them and, and in that way maybe better understanding what motivates them or what they might do next. And I argued that a lot of bad things result in the world from not exercising moral imagination in this sense of just perspective taking, cognitive empathy. And I used... Uh, this example of uh, Saddam Hussein during the, in the run-up to the Iraq War, I argued that if we had done a better job of just figuring out like what, why he's doing what he's doing, how things look from his point of view, we might have avoided the war. Now, the first sentence of your comment on that is, I found myself reacting very strongly against the suggestion that we should have put ourselves in Saddam Hussein's shoes, and I've been thinking a, a bit about what bothers me so much about it. I want to emphasize that this is a big part of the argument I was making, that people do, that when you say, put yourself in this person's shoes, if the person is already defined as an enemy, people react like kind of aversively to that in a way that shapes their subsequent thinking about it. I mean, I may not have been very explicit about the aversive part, but it's very explicit that how we size people up and whether or not we can do a good job of putting ourselves in their shoes depends very much on whether we think of them as an ally or an enemy and and indeed I think this particular cognitive bias is built into us by natural selection and it's a really stubborn thing so I would argue that when you like resist like you don't want to put yourself in his shoes I would say it's a very human reaction 
which I'm saying is part of the problem. Let me let me, let me before you go on. I, I want to maybe ask you something that for clarificatory purposes because it's possible that we have no no, no disagreement at all about this. And so so I, I, if you if you don't mind for just a minute. Um, if you said to me, uh, Dan, war making is a very serious thing. It has tremendous moral implications. Um, it's probably a good idea to really understand the mind of the person you're thinking about going to war with. Um, and in doing so, you may find out things that convince you that as a prudential matter, there are better ways to go about this. Yeah. If that's what you're saying, I agree 100%. We have no disagreement. Wait a minute. Let me just say, ask the second part. If, however, you're saying everything up until the middle part, um, and so as a moral matter, we'd better get to know what's in their minds so that we can make a moral decision about whether to go to war with them or not. Now that's something a different story. In other words, in other words, yeah. I would agree that I might have found out things about Saddam Hussein that might have made me decide that prudentially there's better ways to go about getting rid of him or dealing with him. But I would not agree to the second proposition that somehow getting inside his mind is going to somehow morally change the fact that he's a vicious psychotic monster. I, I didn't I, even allude I, to the <laughs> latter. Uh, to, to, to saying to saying like he's not such a bad guy I didn't I, in fact I explicitly said he is a bad guy I explicitly said that but then if it's purely prudential then it's pretty uncontroversial I mean nobody's gonna say that it's a you bad know, idea this to is know not, the mind of your enemy this is not the only thing I've said that I wouldn't think would be as controversial as it is but uh, I was and and, and, and um, you know I, I want to but on this kind of academic point I want to say uh, Prudential, in my view, often is moral. If the prudential path leads you to kill a couple of hundred thousand fewer people and not create ISIS, which in turn gets Donald Trump nominated president, okay? Like, if you're a consequentialist, as I am, and I'm sure you respect that as whatever your own moral philosophy is, you know, you respect that it's not a crazy thing to be a consequentialist. If you're a consequentialist, prudence is moral or certainly can be and i was making an entirely prudential argument yeah. now and it, it couldn't have i i want to i want to express my deep thanks to a commenter whose handle is spelled g-p-a-n-d-a-t-s-h-a-n-g -A 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 i want to thank him or her for everything except choosing that handle because how who would <laughs> possibly figure out how that is supposed to be pronounced but anyway after you said, it, 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 you said in this, uh, well, you, I'll kind of read your, uh, you know, a couple of things. Uh, you, you, you say, why you disagree, you say, one problem with my argument is this is because for empathy to work at preventing conflict, both sides must do it, and there is zero chance that ISIS or Boko Haram are going to do this. Well, I had explicitly chosen the Iraq example for its asymmetry. I, it, it didn't require... And maybe I should back up at some point and explain the logic. But it was a scenario where if we had understood why he was doing certain things, we would not have taken that as evidence that he actually had weapons of mass destruction. This did not assume any empathy or anything else flowing from his side. Okay, so I agree with that. And look, I mean, I guess the point I was trying to get at was that it certainly... It certainly could be the I could certainly be the case that I could find out things about Saddam Hussein or about Boko Haram or whatever in doing what you talk about, trying to imagine myself in this, just trying to find out things about them and their context and everything, and figure out what how they're thinking. That might lead me to conclude, hey, there's no point in trying to kill this guy, or there's no point in sending a fifty thousand dollars or whatever, because then this is going to happen and that's going to happen, all that's going to happen. But what what it would never do is make me think that they're any less deserving of being destroyed and killed, right? I mean, that's what it wouldn't do, right? I mean, there's nothing that would convince me, there's nothing I would find out about Boko Haram yeah. that would make me think that they don't deserve to be hung from a pole, right? Right. Um, um, especially, you know, after what right. they did to these schoolgirls, right? <clears throat> so so, so I, mm. I then misunderstood you because the practical point I entirely agree with. I think it's stupid 
to go into these countries and not understand the mindset of these people, not understand where they're coming, not, not understand their culture, not understand right. the way they think. Absolutely stupid. And we're particularly guilty of being bad at this right. by the United right. States. And, I agree with that entirely. And when you said I this, misunderstood you. I when you said this, I feel, I feel I, should, I, I should finish off this point about the commenter yeah. I'll call G Pandat Shang. Yeah. Uh, uh, unless it's a panda reference. Well, anyway. The, I just um, say Japan Shang to myself when what I you, see it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, we, we petition you, Japan Shang, to change your username. But I want to I applaud you because, Dan, when you said this, uh, you know, what was wrong with Iraq was not that Sudan was deposed and killed, and I never said it was. Uh, he yeah. deserved nothing less. What was wrong was everything that came along with this, and I agree with that. And you, then you said, but these are the sorts of bad things that are addressed through sound, realistic, prudential del deliberation, I would say, amen, not by way of empathetic consideration on the mindset of mass rapists and murders. And then, and then, uh, and then you go on to say, I would do this for, for entirely prudential reasons, but not because of any consideration for Saddam Hussein. And G. Pandat Chang, or whatever, says, <laughs> says, uh, says no one else has been talking about concern for his well-being, which was true. Yeah. Then I, I misunderstood. But, but, and, but, I but, but and I didn't argue with him about it. But you are, you are not alone because one of the things about human nature is what is set off in people's minds when you say, could we put ourselves in the shoes of this horrible person? And the, the, actually, the, the, the thing that the most common reaction that bothers me most is not something we saw from you, but it's, um, or if you say, can we, I think I can explain why they did this. Okay, like I say, I think I can explain, say, I think I have an explanation for why this guy killed all these people in Orlando. And people, um, so many people immediately say, oh, so it's excusable what they did? So you're, for, you know, and, and I think that is also kind of hardwired into the brain. And it's a real problem you know, trying to just talk about things rationally, because presumably if you understand why people do bad things, you'll have some advantage in trying to prevent bad things in the future. I think that, you know, in my own case, I can't speak for other people's. In my own case, I think part of what blind me a little bit is the word empathy itself, because right. there is a very common right. and appropriate moral use of, right. em of the term empathy, um, which is not the way you were using it with Saddam. And well, you well, even said you were it, but I mean... I, I did. I distinguish between emotional empathy and cognitive empathy. Yeah. And I think it's it's a mistake, maybe, that I've tended to subsume them both under the term moral imagination. But but I, but I then I always... What I'm really interested in is the cognitive empathy, because I think that's the great unused resource. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I agree. I, you have no just no no disagreement for me, and and I'm happy to say that I misunderstood you. If that's indeed if that's what you meant, then I I, I misunderstood it. So you're jumping on board the moral imagination bandwagon, then? Um, you're, you're gonna get I, the tattoo. You are gonna get the tattoo. Let's put it this way: I will never disagree. I will never say that it hurts to know a lot about the other person in one's efforts to be good. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see how it couldn't. I mean, I don't see how ignorance of the other person could possibly ever help. Okay. I mean, the knowledge may not may not, in the end of the day, help. It certainly can't hurt. And, a, and um, a, big, um, a big part of what I was saying was that we now see some kind of cognitive biases that make it hard, even when we try to understand what's going on in the the minds of uh, people, because there's this interesting thing that when we look at our enemies, it turns out, if they do something good, uh, if they do something bad, we attribute that to them. That's like essence of them. That's dispositional. If they do something good, we try to explain it away as a special circumstance that made them do something good. And with our friends and with ourselves, it tends to be the opposite. We do something good and, and we say, of our close friends at least, uh, you know, oh, or our allies, um, oh, that's the way they are, that's the kind of person they are. If they do something bad, oh, they didn't get their nap, peer group pressure, whatever. This seems to be uh, a part of the human cognitive infrastructure, which means that it takes effort to see things clearly. And that helps explain a kind of an interest of mine that I, that I get into later in the lectures is uh, meditation, um, which we, we may have uh, time to get into later. There is one uh, difference between us philosophically that I think just surfaced that didn't surface in the comments section, which is, it sounds like you believe that uh, 
retribution in and of itself is a good thing. So, in other words, if you have the choice of, like, you find somebody who's done something horrible, and you can either just put them on an island so that they never repeat it, or you can kill them, and nobody will know that they were killed, so it won't have any value as a deterrent or anything. You can either kill them secretly, or just put them on an island. It sounds, it sounds maybe I'm wrong, it sounds to me like you, you, you think it would be morally better to kill them, so that, in other words, retribution is a good thing in and of itself. I do think there is such a thing as, des as moral desert, okay. yes. Yes. Um, now, what that, what that translates into, into action, I mean, in terms of, you know, if you ask me what my general views on, you know, crime and punishment are, I would tell you that I think we're far too punitive, right? Um, and, and I would tell you that, you know, I, I think that perhaps in, especially in, cr in criminal justice, um, I would tend more towards your, your view of the, of the uh, less punitive and more functional, right? More, more, right. more pragmatic. Um, but speaking purely morally, I do think that there is such a thing as dessert. I mean, I mean, I, I, you know, I think that there is something that someone like Saddam Hussein deserves, right? Um, yeah, I do I, think that there is something that people like Boko Haram deserve. Yes, I do. Okay, so that's a difference. I mean, I spelled this out uh, in, in my book, The Moral Animal. I had a chapter about this whole issue, but um, I'm not sure that one can coherently characterize the extent of their wrongness of what they've of what they've done without. It impl implying implicitly some sort of notion of dessert, right? I'm not even sure that one can make the negative moral claim without the dessert being implicit in it, right? Um, you mean you can't say what you did is bad unless you say, and it will be good if you suffer for it? I don't know if I did, I don't know if you can say, if you can coherently call something bad without at the same time implicitly claiming that it entails a certain desert on your part, right? Well, I think that is... And the same thing with good. I mean, look, we do this yeah. all the time, right? People deserve... It matters yeah. that people deserve the rewards they get, right? I mean, that matters. It pisses us off. I mean, one of the things that's so aggravating now is the giving of awards for nothing whatsoever, right? Just for showing up, <laughs> right? Um, um, <laughs> right? The, the all must have prizes. The participation um, trophy. Yeah, which goes back to Alice in Wonderland. All must have prizes, right? That's the dominant ethos now. It makes the prize empty, meaningless, right? Uh, um, um, and so I do think that our notions of good and bad carry with them implicitly notions of dessert. Well, I think intuitively they very much do. And in fact, part of the argument I made against retribution being a moral good is that we now have a pretty good idea why this is a an intuition. It was it was built into us by natural selection because of the pragmatic value of punishment. So punishing people is you know has these virtues like they'll be less likely to hurt you again, they'll be less likely to hurt other people again and blah 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 and the argument is that it's because of these pragmatic purposes that natural selection built into us the retributive intuition but once you see that and see that it's only, you know, then that, in my mind, calls into question the intuition itself as distinguished from the pragmatic uh, deployment, yeah, but I, which I, I still favor. Know, as you know, I have very little regard for those kinds of ev psych and ev ethical explanations. I think that they're mostly hand waving and a lot of just so stories and a lot of I, I, I really have no use for them at all. I mean, we could do a whole show about why, mm -hmm. but but. Uh, to me, those are the laziest kinds of explanations of complex social phenomena like morals. Um, and I just don't, you know, when guys tell me that the reason why, you know, um, you, you know, try to give some account of the fact that they're a bunch of philanderers by appealing to the evolutionary advantage of men, males spreading their genes and women not, that's immediately when I, I, I decide that the guy's even a worse bastard than I thought, right? Um, um, because it's, to me, such an obviously, you know, sort of fallacious appeal to some sort of naturalistic account. I mean, I just don't, I just don't see any reason to explain. I, I can look at ethical judgments and look at their semantics and their logic and what they imply and what they don't imply, and I don't have to give some just-so story about my our ancient ancestors and, you know, you know, hanging around in caves and... Okay, let, and me, let me ask you this. Just don't... I don't let, I, let me ask you this. I assume you accept that the brain was built by natural selection, right? Absolutely. Okay, so what is your explanation for the fact that people everywhere, in every culture, have, first of all, the intuition that there is such thing as moral good? People everywhere argue in moral terms. 
that they, they, they say this is morally good, that is not morally good. Moreover, they have specific intuitions that are in common, like bad deeds should be punished, good deeds should be rewarded. But let's let's. How do you explain any of that? Uh, my in answer to that is the, terms. My, my answer to that is similar to the answer that Chesterton gave to the observation that apes are a lot like people, and the answer he gave was yeah, but what's much what's much more interesting is the. T is the tiny ways in which they're not like people. Okay, this um, is one. What's your explanation for and it? I'm, I'm, I'm not in, I, I, I don't, I find much more interesting the fact that we have such radical, wild differences of view of what, of what is good. I'm not really all that interested at all at why people started calling things good. I, I just don't. You're not? No. No. Well, okay. I, I think... You, I'm interested in morals. I'm not interested in, I'm not interested in the Pleistocene origins of I'm just you know look, our, uh, natural selection also gave us the ability to run. Okay, the fact that I might be a, an a marathon enthusiast doesn't mean that I have any interest whatsoever in the evolutionary origins of running. I'm interested in the sociological human uh, uh, phenomenon of athletics and sports and running. I'm not interested. Uh, okay, to but do you do you do you not do you not think that, I mean, one thing philosophers do is decide whether, I mean, ethical philosophers consider the question of whether it makes sense to obey moral intuitions, whether they reflect moral truth. And do you not think it's relevant to that question whether certain moral intuitions were built into us by natural selection for specific purposes or, or weren't? You don't think that's relevant to the discussion of whether we should obey our moral intuitions? As to, to, as to whether I have an obligation to meet my friend for lunch? No, I don't. Well, no, but I'm not asking that. I'm not on Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm asking, interested in the moral it, questions. What? I'm interested in, in the moral questions. I'm not interested in the biological predicate upon which the ability to have moral views rests. Just as, you know, I'm interested in tennis, but I'm not interested at all in the evolutionary biology that led to people being able to move their arms and legs. I'm just not interested in those things. Okay, so if a philosopher... I'm not a scientist. So if a philosopher walks up to you and says, you know, <clears throat> I, as an ethical philosopher, I'm, fo I'm really interested in this question, which I'm sure you, you agree is legitimate in itself, a legitimate interest, of whether moral intuitions uh, are to be trusted, whether they bring us you know, closer to something to be called moral truth or not, and I think re as background for making that consideration and as relevant background that may affect my views, I want to know whether natural selection built these intuitions into us. And if so, what was the logic behind that? You would say to that philosopher, this is totally misguided. You're wasting your time. No, I'm just, it's just not, I mean, look, there's a certain subset of moral philosophers who are interested in ev, 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 ev morals, ev ethics. It's a very small percentage, I will tell you. Um, but there's a percentage of moral philosophers that are interested in ev ethics. Most are not. Um, most philosophers who do normative ethics do it very nicely and do very interesting work. Never talk about evolution once. Well, and and I and I never mention it once in an entire career's worth of work. And um, um, I just uh, I don't find these where did it all come from questions very interesting. I'm interested in the social phenomena, the logic of the social phenomena. The, in, the internal dynamics and logic of the social phenomena. Um, I do, by the way, you know, have a view about moral intuition. I mean, I think that moral intuition, you know, ultimately winds up being the providing the conditions of adequacy against which any moral theory is assessed. I mean, if you look at all of the most potent objections to utilitarianism and to Kantianism. It always comes down to intuitive responses to cases, right? Now you might say, "Well," and so I take I take I take moral intuition as being uh, as providing really the ultimate conditions of adequacy against which we judge any moral theory. Um, but look, I mean, you have to remember something. I mean, it's only a certain kind of philosophical tradition that really believes that there have to be answers to why questions that go all the way down. Um, Wittgenstein very famously says, you know, when you get to, when you get to the end, uh, you know, simply have to say this is what we do, um, and um, and I'm sympathetic to that. Partly because I think once you go be be below a certain level, you're not answering the same questions anymore. You're answering a different kind of question, and you're really not giving the kind of why that people mean when they're ask when they ask for it, right? Um, 
like I said, you know, evolution explains at some level why our arms and legs move, but it doesn't answer any of the interesting why questions we have about marathon culture. And um, I feel the same way about ethics. Yeah. I really do. Um, I don't think it tells us anything that's really interesting with regard to what we typically want to know with regard to morals um, Okay. Uh, at but, the but, normative but, level, at the level of, you know, you ought to do this, you ought not to do that. Okay. The last uh, thing I'd say, and then I'll give you the last word on this before we move on to something else, is the argument you've been making for the last few minutes, which is like, I'm just not interested in this question. That's not the argument you started out with. The, ar the argument you started out with is, look, the ev psych explanation of why we have moral intuitions is a bullshit explanation. Okay. I didn't that, say that. that. Well, you said it's just so stories. It's not to be taken seriously. That's why. I'm, that's why. I'm, that's why I don't, I don't have much use for them because that's my view of them, and that that it's. Well, these are two that, separate. No, 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 no. You've been making the arguments in the last few minutes that you're just not interested. And right, because I think that they're just so stories, and I don't think that they tell us the sorts of. I, I think that what happens is we ask why a few times, and then. At a certain point, we really ought to stop and say, this is just what we do. But because we're in a grip of a certain kind of a view that I think is excessively rationalistic, we keep asking the why. It takes us down to lower levels of explanation where the kinds of answers that you're going to get aren't capable of answering the sorts of whys that are what you started with. I mean, okay, that's, well now, that's, now, now, again, you are making an argument that the, the issue is just not interesting in principle. In my in my view, yes, but okay, I mean, I don't but that's different from the argument that that the Ebb psych uh, explanation doesn't deserve respect. Let's put it this way: I've I've not spent one inch of my energies trying to convince people. Uh, to, I've not published any articles going after Ebb psych explanations. Um, if people ask me or try to throw them at me, I will tell them that I don't think that they're of much use. But but um, at least not to the questions I'm interested in. But I'm also not under the illusion that the questions I'm interested in are the only questions that anybody could be interested right. in. I well, mean, that's you know, uh, I don't begrudge somebody point. being interested. I don't begrudge somebody else being interested in something else. But um, if we're talking about ethics, about what, how we ought to behave, should I do this? Shouldn't I do that? Should that guy do this? Shouldn't I do that? If he does this, and I think he shouldn't have done it, what should I do about it, or how should I think about it? I I, I don't I don't think Ev answers give you tell you anything. In, in anything of use, okay. honestly. Why don't we, um, let's just spend, if we can spend a tiny amount of time on a couple of, uh, we, we both kind of got blowback for being uh, hard on the new atheists in, in our previous dialogue. Did we? A little bit. Now, uh, people, get, people gave us trouble for that? Yeah. I thought somebody said we spent uh, well, I, I think somebody... they accuse you of letting me Spend too Not much time on it when I said we spent like three minutes on it. Right, but I think somebody didn't like the fact that you seemed to not disagree with me. Uh, you oh. seemed to also not have an, uh, an entirely flattering uh, view of them. I just want to be clear on a couple of things. A commenter named Eli says, it seems a good deal of Bob's issue with atheism rests on, on that definition, which implies a denial of God. 100% wrong. The atheism part doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> okay? well, you're an atheist yourself, aren't you? <laughs> Uh, I would call myself an agnostic. That, right, but that's uh, close enough, right? <laughs> well, no, I think I think I'm kind of like. Uh, well, we'll get to this in the next thing. I mean, as you know, I like to at least discuss the question of whether there could be higher purpose and so on. But but right, it's not the atheism, uh, and Ocean uh, correctly answers that. Uh, yeah, I remember replies that, that no, my issue is with uh, being gratuitously offensive. The other thing is, I you know I. A lot of a, a kind of unifying theme in these talks. Well, no, there aren't enough unifying themes in these talks, probably, and it could, they could have stood to have more. But one is kind of about the whole psychology of tribalism, uh, which I think is the great threat to humankind. The cognitive biases that lead groups of people to, to have conflicts with one another. And Jake Zielsdorf, who should be commended for having a very straightforward username, uh, says that might be his actual name. You know, I know. Well, that's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Saves a lot of time. <laughs> says Bob's anti-tribal stance is revealed as a sham when he consistently disparages the new atheists, his outgroup of choice. First of all, as another commenter whose name I wish I could remember noted I, uh, somewhere, I said, I, I acknowledge that when I view the new atheists, uh, I have to worry about my own cognitive biases because I do define them as, as in some ways the opposition. But the other thing is, when I say I'm against, that, that the psychology of tribalism is a problem, 
I'm not against critically evaluating groups of people and criticizing them when you think they're doing something wrong, okay? Uh, now, I, I do, uh, I can succumb to cognitive biases like the next person, and it's a constant struggle. It's like, you know, you, you'll, you'll like see something Sam Harris said that sounds outrageous, and you almost don't want to read on because you're afraid that the context will make it sound less outrageous, right? I mean, that's the way... Oh, I thought you don't want to keep reading because you think you're going to get even madder by the next thing he no, says. No, no, I love to get <laughs> mad at my opponents. No, that's my point, is that we, we love to confine ourselves to the evidence that seems to sustain our opposition to people we think of as opponents. And, 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 uh, and we all have to be conscious of that. And I'm, 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 I'm especially bad about this. Maybe I'm wrong about this, but I thought that part of Jake's point was that it's weird to be anti-tribal and then to be hostile towards the new atheists but friendly towards religion. Because if anything, religion is the source of most tribalisms and the new atheists, part of the reason they're against religion is because of the tribalism that comes with it. Yeah, but this is a difference of opinion between me and the new atheists. I don't think religion is... I think it's far from clear that religion is on balance a bad thing. Many good things have been done in the name, many bad things. I think... Uh, it's now, certainly, a, certainly a main source of, a primary source of, tri of tribalism, of well, negative tribalism. Well, it, it's often associated with it. But that, but, but see, like when you see Sunni Shia uh, infighting, okay, the new atheists think, oh, it gets down to the difference between their religious doctrines of the two. And I just think that's totally nonsense and incredibly naive. It's like... Yes, it matters that they have different ethnic markers. It matters that they say, I'm Sunni, they're Shia. It mattered that in Northern Ireland they said, I'm Catholic, they're Protestant. It matters that people have these different group identities. But who really believes that in Northern Ireland this was a doctrinal dispute no, about, but, I mean, about whether, whether you get uh, salvation via faith or works? But it doesn't, wait a minute, but, but to be fair, look, you, you still may be right, but to be fair about it, um, it could be still a function of religion and not doctrine, right? I mean, I mean, look. Here's a fair question to ask: If both the Northern Irish, and both sides of the Northern Irish were both Protestants, would we still be have would we would we still have the same fight, right? I mean, um, no, you know, but but that's my a point fair is question it, to ask, right? No, we wouldn't. But my point is, it wouldn't matter if they were all Protestants or all atheists. Either way, we wouldn't have the fight. And the new atheists do believe there's a big difference there. They believe that just religious belief is is bad. Is well, the source of the bad no, no, things. No, no, no. But I, I do think look, here's a fair point though. I mean, to the extent to which religious and look, my religion is not a very good example of this just because it doesn't hold a view like this, but if you have a religion that holds a very particular and exclusivist notion of salvation, right, then you could see how someone could think wow, two religions that have contradictory views on salvation are going to have a mutually exclusive not contra exclusive and contradictory views of salvation have an immediate natural point of hostility between them, right? It, 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 it could be, but, but I would argue that if you look at the actual facts on the ground about Sunni and Shia and trace the actual sources of tension, it's very much about material factors like, uh, you know, uh, Shia uh, right now running Iraq, whereas Sunni ran it before, and now you've got a formerly empowered, suddenly disenfranchised group, and blah, blah, blah. Wherever you look, Lebanon, uh, Iraq, these kinds of socioeconomic and political yeah, differences yeah. between your groups are very relevant. Yeah, my, listen, my father believes all wars are economic, ultimately. I mean, I mean, so, I mean, that's a perfectly respect, I mean, a perfectly respectable position, so, um, um, it's not something I would want to argue about, and I, I don't know enough about it anyway. I yeah, mean, well, I'm mainly emphasizing that this is... I, I'm not saying I couldn't be wrong about this. I'm just emphasizing this is a difference between me and the new atheists. Yeah, That's yeah. really important to me because I think what, in my view, is a misdiagnosis of the sources of so-called religious uh, violence leads to all kinds of counterproductive policy responses. Okay, yeah. So. yeah, no, I agree with that, and I think, I think at the heart of the new atheists' complaint is one I do think maybe that they're though they're they may be erroneous. They I do think that they think that religion is a major source of of dysfunctional tribalism. And also I think that they're simply offended, both aesthetically and on other grounds, 
by the holding of any beliefs that they take to be non-rational, right? Um, um, I, I think I really do think that they, they they are scientistic in a way for the most part. That I also have no sympathy for. <laughs> that that I have no sympathy for. Um, um, but um, let me. One thing about tribes that I did want to say though, and, and this is the difficulty that I have in entirely, in entirely hating them on the one hand, and on the other hand, embracing the kind of cosmopolitanism that you that you like to um, that you're that you're endorsing. And that is for all the negative things that tribes and nations give us. It seems to me they've also given us all the best things. Um, um, mm -hmm. um, it's it's in the tribalism that all the distinctive, the really distinctive flavors of culture come from, mm -hmm. and the notion of a much more generic kind of universal. Um, I just despair for my meals, you know. I despair for my, <laughs> I despair, for, I despair for my fine arts. I despair for my. Yeah, but you know, um, it's in um, the most cosmopolitan milieus where you find the greatest diversity of ethnic cuisine. But because they come together, but I don't know that there would have been that they ever would have been created in the first place. I agree with you that the cosmopolitan areas now are the places where you're most likely to find the most because that's where the, all these people figure out how to yeah. get along. But I don't know if you would have had such distinctive, and I'm using flavor now metaphorically. Yeah. I don't know that you would have had so many distinctive flavors if you didn't have these very distinctive tribes, right? I mean, I mean, so, so it's hard for me to feel entirely bad about negatively about them just because they, it seems to me they've given me given us yeah. much of what I think is the best look, human look, culture. Grew, and, and just more broadly, I mean, tri if you look at tribe in the broader sense, you know, like groups of people who like. To play chess or whatever. I mean, I mean, there will be a affiliate human affiliation. You know, for as long as there are humans, there will be groups. There will, in some sense, be tribes. You know, hobby tribes or whatever. Um, and uh, and there can even be ethnic affinity that does not rest on a sense of antagonism with other ethnicities. For example, so it's not like I uh, anticipate the end of tribes in the broadest sense and you know somebody uh, this has been an issue because I've uh, the term uh, tribeless tribe has come up a couple of times I've kind of thought like well maybe what human you know what maybe what we need to do is start the tribeless tribe in other words get all the people together who say look my fundamental affiliation is with humanity writ large it's like with the planet and I have and although I there are groups I belong to none of them takes precedence over my concern for the welfare of hum humankind broadly you could maybe call that the tribeless tribe, and then people point out, wait a second, that's a tribe. Yeah, that's yeah. that's par too paradoxical or something. But, uh, you know, just to be clear, it, it isn't tribes in the sense of groups that are bound by common interest or even necessarily ancestry or belief that bothers me. It's just, it's just a tribal identity that rests for its strength on a sense of antagonism with other tribes. Let me just say one last thing about this. I mean, this is an empirical question, and so I'm just I'm just armchair throwing at it. I, um, I'd love I'd love to hear a sociologist or an anthropologist uh, talk away on this. But I wonder whether, if we agree that there's sort of very distinctive um, flavors in terms of arts and culture that come out of the different tribes, I wonder if those are are those are can be unentangled. From the negative dimensions of tribes that you rightly dislike so much, and let me just throw out one reason why you might think they might not be, and that is, I don't know that you can disentangle really, really great creation like that from certain kind of sense of of tribal pride that are at the heart of then the the negative also of the negative uh, dimensions of tribal of tribal of tribal existence, right? In other words. It's precisely that pridefulness about one's cuisine or one's art, you know, one's art or one's literature, one's that both makes you compare it unfavorably to the other guy and, and demean, demean the other guys, but at the same time is what makes it make you make your own so wonderful, right? Yeah, although I would say, <clears throat> look, if but you this look is an empirical question. I'm just wondering whether well, that sort one of one thing I'd say is in New York, new cuisines are being created every nanosecond. I mean, and, and what's driving it? Status competition among chefs. And they're not killing each other. I mean, really, seriously. They'd like to, but they're They'd not. like to, but they, <laughs> but they don't. Uh, 
So anyway, fair me, enough. Uh, fair enough. I would like to spend a little time on the subject of mindfulness because this came up. Yes, sure. In another uh, context, uh, there was a dialogue between Ben Kaznoka and uh, Dina Kaplan, I think it is, who has started a uh, some kind of a mindfulness meditation thing in New York. She's a, a an entrepreneur. She's been one all her life, but now she's one in kind of this space uh, as a result of uh, some kind of personal experiences that led her to meditation. And um, you, uh, uh, in the comments section, uh, it would be too simple to say that you said mindfulness is bullshit. But why don't you tell me what it I is you what, what it is you said about mindfulness? There seemed there was something that one of them said, and I don't remember exactly how they put it, but sort of like the more mindful and thoughtful people are the more likely they are to behave well towards one another, right? Um, and what I tried to point out was that um, I, didn't, I don't believe that thoughtfulness per se yeah. has any particular moral valence, right? And that I think that there's sometimes a real danger in thinking that the reason why the other guy is behaving in ways I don't like is that he's just not thought it through enough, right? Um, it never occurs to you that he may have thought it through and come to the opposite conclusion that you did, right? Right. And, and it almost seems to me like there's this desire to avoid the very difficult process and, the, and a process which you often will lose, right? The very difficult process of moral uh, negotiation uh, and moral, moral discourse and moral disagreement and moral disputation. Um, you know... You may have to confront the other guy's values and right. argue with him, and um, you may not win. And there may be more of him than of you. And the thought that oh, if we all just sat down, and hummed and closed our eyes and thought very deeply, <laughs> and thought very deeply. Well, I, I say, I mean, you, the pictures that are associated. I mean, they put up these pictures of these really hipster-looking people sitting in some obviously very expensive office. Right, um, with all with their eyes closed and various varieties of hairy beards and stuff. I mean, it, it was a bit, a bit of, hey, it was hey, a hey, bit hey, of a caricature. Hey, hey. No, no anti beard bias here. There, there is, I too. do draw the line somewhere, Dan. I've had one too, so you know. But it, it was, it, it sort of invited a bit of a, a bit of a, a, a chuckle. But in all seriousness, I, I do think that there is a danger in thinking that well, if we just all did this, we wouldn't have to bother with the very difficult task of moral disputation because everyone would wind up agreeing with each other. And I just think that that's wrong. I think it's facile. I think, I think it's well-meaning. Um, um, I do think, I'm not accusing millennials of this, but it's a very typically millennial way of thinking. That's why millennials like this sort of stuff so much and they hate conflict. And so what better thing, I mean, uh, my students are so allergic to any kind of, you look them in the eye and try to really confront them on something, and they look like they want to curl under a table, right? Um, I just, I, I think it plays into a lot of, um, uh, how shall I say, wish fulfillment that we have now, that things wouldn't be so damn difficult with other people. <laughs> and, um, and I just don't think that those things are avoidable. I really don't. Okay, I think... Um... I think part of the problem here is the word mindfulness. I mean, uh, I would argue for a, uh, a conception of it that's a little different from the one you laid out. And one reason this is hard to do is talk, talk about a conception of mindfulness is because there's a lot of different conceptions of it out there. And, uh, you know, it does have a place deep in Buddhist philosophy in the sense that... Uh, one of the factors in the, the eight factors that constitute the so-called eightfold path, that is the path to salvation in Buddhism, the path to liberation, <clears throat> one of them is mindfulness. At least that's the way the word has been translated. The word is sati. And it's been translated as mindfulness. So you can argue uh, that, uh, although it could have been translated other ways, for whatever reason, mindfulness is the word we have. And there is there are ancient, ancient texts prescribing ways to do sati meditation, mindfulness meditation. And then there's also, in the modern world, all these people saying, I'm doing mindfulness meditation. Now, almost none of these people are actually doing 
quite exactly what was prescribed in the text because that's the way things are. You know, traditions evolve. Yeah, of course. Uh, and, 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 and people mean a lot of different things about it. There's mindfulness-based stress reduction, uh, but there are also people... Uh, th there's also mindfulness in the service of so-called Vipassana meditation, which is insight meditation, which is explicitly aimed at getting deep into a, getting a much deeper understanding of like me metaphysics, like the nature of reality. And mindfulness is thought to be an essential uh, tool. Right. So it means a lot of different things. But I do think in many of these circles, what it's come to mean is something other than just uh, thoughtfulness or even examining your thoughts. I mean, I, I get the sense that what you took it to mean is almost deliberation, like do deliberation. Well, to be fair, part of the reason that you said thoughtfulness was because they used that word in the, in the dialogue. In other words, I didn't invent that, and I didn't actually know whether they meant by my thoughtfulness as a synonym for what they meant by mindfulness uh -huh. or not. But that's why I used the word thoughtful, because they used it in the discussion. Um, um, but I'm happy to have it disambiguated that well, doesn't mean that I'm going to find it any more plausible to think that if someone would just be mindful, he would behave in the way you wanted, right? Yeah. No, I, <laughs> or in a way that you liked. Right. Yeah, no, all I would say is that many people, especially the people who are most... The Buddhists in go and murder Hindus, right? I mean, I mean, <laughs> right? I mean, it's not as if they're, as if they're, as if violence is alien, <laughs> Right to Buddhist to Buddhist uh, civilization. Well, no, that's not the same. I mean, very few of those Buddhists were probably meditating at all. Most Asian Buddhists don't meditate, by the way. Yeah, it's not part of the deal. Some of the monks do, some don't. But it's the 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 meditation has become the core of the Western conception of Buddhism. It's far from the core of the right, right, Eastern conception. Right. But but anyway, that's not to say you couldn't be a meditator and be a bad person. You can, but. But I would say that what is meant by mindfulness to, by, you know, if you go to the kind of serious like retreat centers where the teachers are actually pretty learned and they've all done really super extensive meditation, it's what is meant by mindfulness typically is something pretty profound that does involve, in a sense, in a sense introspection, but it involves such thorough and rigorous uh, examination of your own feelings and your own thoughts that, you know, at the end of one of these retreats, when you've been doing this for a week, every day, a silent meditation retreat, or, or 10 days or two weeks, um, you're really, in my experience, you are at least for a little while a different kind of person. And, and one thing you are is very aware. Remember at the beginning of this uh, dialogue, I said, I think when you, when you tell people to put yourself in the shoes of the enemy, just something happened. They, they get like, they don't like that. There, there's an aversion that, that they may barely consciously feel. And that in turn triggers a cognitive reaction that involves looking at that enemy in a certain way and blah, blah, blah. When you're really being mindful, and it's hard to sustain this in the workaday world when you got to go to work and stuff. But when you are really in a frame of mind that I would call mindful, you're like really aware of all that stuff. Like the aversion is so, you know, so vivid to you. It's like it doesn't escape you that you're being uh, kind of reactively moved into a particular cognitive space. And as a result of that awareness of your feelings, you're less likely to be moved into that cognitive space. So it really changes... Uh, I, I think mindfulness in the in the fairly deep sense of the term can really uh, change your uh, consciousness. It's really hard to do, it's hard to sustain, and so on. But I just want to make the point that the word can mean something uh, deeper and, and requ requiring much more rigorous discipline than, than than what you often hear. When you, when you hear things like, it means live in the moment. It, well, no, actually... Uh, that's not. But it's very not. Important. It's not. It's, it's not something that would produce any kind of moral or axiological, in the sense of values-based unanimity. Now, and so it's not. It's not. So, so it's not. It's not going to be well, anything. Actually, that's going to guarantee that you're then afterwards going to go and behave in a way that I that I morally approve of. Oh, it it doesn't. But it it, it would. De I think it would defuse a lot of arguments because so many arguments involve not taking into account the perspective of the other person in either the sense of cognitive empathy or maybe emotional empathy. And, and 
and, and involve not being sufficiently aware that your, your side of the argument is, is motivated very much by self-interest. I mean, sure, the side, sure it's so, good for you if you win the argument, but it's not, it's not an objectively warranted uh, outcome. So, so if I am if I am um, um, if I am a devout uh, uh, pro-lifer mm -hmm. um, who believes that the killing of uh, fe uh, of unborn fetuses is uh, a moral crime, and you and I go into a meditation retreat, you're going to come out pro-life. No, I'm not. First of all, I'm not saying this would end all moral disagreement. No, no, but wait a minute. So you're still going to engage in behaviors that I find absolutely appalling, right? Uh, actually, I think uh, the volume you're going to go, you're of the go march and pro-choice rallies. I, I, I do think which I think are pro-murder rallies. I do think, uh, if nothing else, and I think this is a value in itself. If these two people on two sides of the argument did this two week silent meditation retreat, I think more often than not, if nothing else, the subsequent argument would be more civil and less ad hominem, and both would do a better job of seeing the perspective of the other person. Right, but at the end of the day, you're going to be out advocating for something that I view as tantamount to murder. So I'm going to have a very dim view of you as a person. Actually, you may have a less dim view. But, but anyway, I'm not saying all moral disagreement ends. I'm, I'm certainly not saying that. Now, yep. mm. now, if you want to carry it all the way to in liberation, enlightenment, nirvana, then you're talking about such a thorough transformation that there might be no arguments. But that's a pretty hypothetical thing because it's not clear there are any enlightened beings in the world. Uh, I also wonder, I mean, I don't know about, have they done any demographic studies of, of, these, of the people who are inclined to do this? I mean, I would suspect that the sorts of people who go into these uh, meditation seminars already probably agree on most things to begin with, right, value-wise. Uh, I think that's one of the problems you have. You would have so how do you know the result yeah. of the meditation and not the fact that they're already simpatico with each other? Yeah, it's a hard thing to get at empirically, yeah. Yeah, that's why I'm pretty dubious. But I'm mainly saying that what the word means is, is, is not just be very deliberate in your decision making, be very thoughtful in the conventional sense of the word. It's really changing your relationship to your feelings and including feelings that guide cognition. That's that's my main point. Okay. Now I think here we face a decision. So we've been going on long enough. This is like this is fifty two minutes. That's a lot. Yeah. We have this whole second uh subject we want to discuss. You want to sign off and start another dialogue and see how far we get? Sure. Okay, so, well, thanks for this one, and, and uh, I think the next one we do may be my final uh, act of this kind of self-indulgence. Okay. Possibly ever. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. See you soon. See you in one moment.